Hey, good morning and welcome to Real Life Church Online. If it's your first time here, hi, my name is Raul. And I'm Stacy. Welcome. Happy Independence Day yeah, weekend. Yeah, it's the weekend. If you're watching this on, on the 3rd, happy almost 4th of July. Yes. If you're watching this after, we're so glad. We hope you had a safe and a fun time with your family. Um, right now, we're going to go to time of worship. Yes. So if you are at home, go ahead and stand on up and worship with us. If you're in the car, keep driving. We're going to join you right back after that. Talk to you about what's going on in the life of the church. I'll never be more loved than I am right now Wasn't holding you up So there's nothing I could do to let you down It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud I'll never be more loved than I am right now Going through a storm
Hey, welcome back. Um, thank you so much, uh, worship team. Every single Sunday, whether you're watching online or you're here at one of our campuses in person, we have incredible musicians who lead us in songs together as a church family. Um, and another, another thing that's coming up as a church family that we get to do is happening this Friday, July 8th, here at this Valley Center campus, I believe at 7 p.m. Is that correct? That is okay, right. I was right, 7 p.m. I'm sure there's a thing on the screen that says what time it's at. We have our worship night. Yes. This isn't a typical mm -hmm. um, service with a message. This is just an evening for us to come together 
praise God, sing some songs for what, what he's doing in our life, what he has done and what he will do. Pray together. So we'd love to see you and your entire friends and family there. Again, it's at yeah. the Valley Center campus this Friday night at 7 p.m. Uh, we'll hopefully be outside in the courtyard, but if it's too hot or there's a lot of people, we'll move inside. Absolutely. And then tying in with our series of listening to God, we are going to go through a series together with Pastor Jim on Sunday nights on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So if you are already joining us virtually for church, this is a great way for you to get continuing to get plugged in, but to get more out of what's happening through our Sunday, Sunday messages with this additional bit of information, more teaching, but also it's going to be very hands-on. Yes. There's going to be prayer exercises and what does it mean to listen to God? What, did it, what does it mean to know that he's actually at work in your life. It's going to be pretty extraordinary. So there's a lot going on for kids and students. Uh, we actually have a mission trip going on next week. Yes. But if you go to reallife.la slash summer, you can sign up for the prayer class. You can find out more information about worship night. You can find out all the things going on for kids and students this summer. Yeah, and as we head into this weekend with our students, uh, and then after that, we have vacation Bible school for hundreds of kids. Um, we do these things, um, one, because they're fun. But the real reason we do them is because um, life change happens. We get to see kids and students and adults um, get baptized in Jesus' name, give their life to Jesus Christ for the first time, feed hundreds of people on our Saturday um, food pantry at our Glendora campus. And food, I don't know if you've gone to the grocery store recently, it's not cheap. Uh, and the things we do in this ministry that actually serve our community have an impact. And it's so cool that not just us as staff members, but all of us, you watching at home, um, you can be a part of that. And the way to do that is financially. Um, or one way to do it also is to pray, but financially you can partner with us and there's easy ways to do that. Absolutely. You can go to reallife.la slash give. You can also email us and ask questions about what it means to give, where the dollars actually go. Mm -hmm. We're very transparent about all of that. And if you've been with us for a little while, we really want you to step in faith and prayerfully consider what it would look like to say no to that thing that you've been thinking that you want or that thing that you think that you need. But what is it that God is calling you to say yes to? And if again, if you've been with us for a little while, you've heard Pastor Jim say, you don't need to give to this church. You can give to a different organization, but what does it look like to take a step in, in faith, but also a spiritual discipline, again, of saying no to what is that thing mm -hmm. that I don't need, but mm -hmm. I want to see what God is going to do with this. We have a speaker. We do. This Sunday, yes. <laughs> His name is Ryan Montague. He's an author. He's a local professor. He's fantastic. We know that you're going to really enjoy the message. Yeah. We've already heard him practicing it. Mm -hmm. So here you go, Ryan Montague. We'll see you back here after that. Well, hello, Real Life Church. I'm Ryan Montague, so blessed to, to be here with you. I think this is my third year in a row of coming to do a guest sermon. And I'm really pumped about being able to join you all for this sermon series, Encountering God. So it's awesome to be uh, with you all here in the room, but also those watching the live stream, perhaps at home or those over in Glendora. And so it is my honor and privilege to be here with you as part of the sermon series, Encountering God, which I'm incredibly passionate about. And in particular, I have an opportunity to share my testimony, which is on this topic of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this is something that has radically uh, changed my life, transformed my life, and empowered my faith. And it's something that took me way too long in my spiritual walk and spiritual journey with Christ to learn about, to hear about, to press into, and to experience. But it is for sure, without a doubt, a single point on a calendar, a moment in my life that I will never forget. In fact, it was September 22nd, 2017, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so I just want to share this 
testimony of my personal walk in it and, and since uh, on the other side of it. And also encourage you all to press in. Those of you that have not experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're going to break down what exactly even is that that I'm even talking about. And what does it mean for you personally? And at what level do you press into this and experience it and be able to walk then from it? And so with that, I'm going to open up with a word of prayer and then we're going to dive right in. But dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you and I praise you and I lift your name high that this is all for Jesus Christ. That today is a moment to be able to speak on, to, to lead into the baptism of the Holy Spirit, something that is a treasured moment in my life, receiving an immersion of your Holy Spirit and empowerment to be sent forth, to be transformed. And I just pray, God, that today would be a day that someone would, would have ears to hear what you want them to experience, what, they want, what you want them to know, that they would encounter you in a fresh, new, powerful way, that perhaps today could be the day that's marked on their calendar in their life that they will never forget. So Lord, soften our hearts to your word, to your ways, that you would speak in me and through me, and that we would have a glorious time worshiping, honoring you, and pressing in to experience and encounter more and more and more of you, God. For you are everlasting, you are eternal, you are all-encompassing, so that we never reach the end of getting to know you. We never reach a final destination of empowerment with you. But there's always more experience, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, mercy, to experience in you. So Lord, we just thank you and praise you. And it's in your mighty name we pray, amen. All right, well, as I was saying that this moment, this baptism of the Holy Spirit is that leading up to this is that to give you a little bit of context is that I was 36 at the time of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I grew up uh, Catholic. I went to Catholic grade school through eighth grade, went to Catholic mass every Sunday uh, until about 23 when I moved to Hollywood, California. And a friend uh, took me to a church in LA that began to really open things up in a more personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And then it's been this crazy journey of continuing to experience more and more of God, in particular by running with people that were ahead of me in the faith that had pressed in and experienced and had crazy encounters with God, that they brought their passion, their testimony, their excitement to me and made me hunger and yearn for more and to, to allow me to taste and see that the Lord is good and that there was something yet to be experienced and to press into and, and to go to another level with God. And as a result of that, it's for the purposes of sanctification, becoming more and more like Christ and being empowered to be his witness in this world and in this season of our lives. And so as a result of, of this experience, which really Pastor Anthony last week talked on Acts chapter two and Pentecost the day where the Holy Spirit fell on the 120 men and women that were in the upper room where they had the tongues of fire overhead and they began to speak in tongues and be empowered for the miraculous is that that was their moment. That was their point on their calendar in their life where they would never be the same again after experiencing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when you look at the life of the disciples, even as you're going through the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you get to the book of Acts, and, and from that point on, from chapter 2, in the day of Pentecost and beyond, you can see a radical change from the pre-Pentecost disciples and the post-Pentecost disciple is that when you look at pre-Pentecost Peter versus post-Pentecost Peter, you see a dramatic shift and change in terms of a boldness and a confidence where he was once denying Jesus three times, is that then post-Pentecost, he was willing to be imprisoned. He was willing to have his life threatened and go to his cross. And so there's a dramatic change once the Holy Spirit empowers you and, and, and uh, comes over you in this full flooding experience. 
And so there was this, this time prior to this, for 36 years of my life, having gr- grown up in the church and grown up in Christianity, that not knowing that there was so much more to be desired, even though I, I knew that, I had a yearning in my heart, but nobody was mentioning or telling me, you still have so much more that you could be experiencing, that you could be empowered with, and you could be transformed in a radical new way. I felt it and I knew it in my heart that the way I was living and my experience and relationship with Christ was not what he had died for, that there was so much more. And in fact, it was uh, about a year and a half or so before the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, moment for me is when I had committed to waking up every morning early to be able to read the Bible for about an hour to an hour and a half each morning. And it was in that season of reading God's word uh, in such depth and for such a lengthy period of time each and every day that I realized that this book is filled with the supernatural. It's, fear, it's filled with miracles. It's filled with personal first-hand encounters with God. And that was just not what I was experiencing in my life. And I knew the way that I was living was not reflective of what they were experiencing in the Bible. And I had the option to either try to lower the word of God to the level or the lack of my experience or to maintain the status of the Bible and to raise my level of experience to the level of the word of God. And that's what I committed to going after wholeheartedly. Because what I had an experience to to see was that my in-laws, my wife's parents, is that began to, when we got married and started spending more and more time together, I recognized that these were Christ followers. And again, he was a pastor and, and uh, my mother-in-law, her parents were missionaries to Africa. And there was this, this engagement with the word, but it wasn't just because they were pastor, or just because they were missionaries that I noticed a difference in them is that I could tell that even though we were both Christians, that they had something that I didn't have. And over time, I realized that it happened to be this baptism in the Holy Spirit, that they were endued with a power and a peace that surpassed all understanding that that I hadn't yet experienced, but I was yearning for and desiring so much for in my life because I loved Christ and I was pressing in like in all the ways that I knew how, but yet there was still something left to be desired or left to be experienced. And that's where I wanna pick up in this process is, is being able to walk through some scriptures that were helpful for me in knowing what exactly is this baptism of the Holy Spirit? How is it different than what I had experienced previously? Where is this in scripture? And then also, what does it look like to actually pray for this, to press into this, to go after this thing with shameless persistence until the Father delivers the Holy Spirit? And so, first of all, this starts in John 20, 20 verses 22. So John chapter 20, verses 20 through 22. And this is Jesus speaking to the the disciples. This idea that they had received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as a mark and as a seal initially. So as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Then he breathed and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. But here he is at the end of John saying to them that he breathed and they received the Holy Spirit. And so how is this different receiving the Holy Spirit versus being baptized in the Holy Spirit? Because we know that when you profess your faith, when you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you receive his spirit. In Ephesians chapter 1, 13 through 14, it says this, and when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. So when we first believe in Jesus Christ, we do receive the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't just stop there. Is that with God, there is always so much more. And so I want to give you this illustration. Is that uh, there is a spot sometimes where my family will go up to the, to the mountain. And there are some hiking trails and different things that go up the mountain a little ways. 
And as you begin to go up these hiking trails, you will come across this stream that's coming down the mountain. And the stream is actually really amazing. And it's fun to be able to stop and play and hang out and camp out at this stream and enjoy the stream so much. And just imagine that if you kept going to this mountain, this hiking trail, and you kept coming across the stream, and as soon as you got to the stream, you stopped and you camped out at the stream. And you did this again and again and again, trip after trip after trip, year after year after year. And then eventually, one of these several trips later, years later, you're hanging out at the stream, and somebody's coming down from the mountain that's gone even higher and further than you have. And they say to you, wow, and you're bragging, here you are bragging about the stream and talking about how much you enjoy the stream. And they look at you, and all of a sudden they ask, yeah, the stream is incredible, but have you been to the waterfall that's up a little bit further. And you're kind of standing there staring at him, having realized that you've been here so many times before. You've been here for years on end, and you had no clue that if you kept going and you kept pressing in, that you would have experienced an encounter fall and encountered a waterfall. And that's how I actually felt when it came to Christianity, when it came to life in Christ, when it came to the Holy Spirit, is that nobody had told me that up ahead, when you continue to press forward and continue to go on, that there is actually a huge waterfall that is all-consuming, all-powerful, and immersing in the Spirit. Here I was camped out at the stream, having just taken the Bible's word for it that I had the spirit in me, that that was as far as I could go, but yet there was still more. And this is where in Luke chapter 11, uh, verses 5 through 13, and Jesus is talking to the disciples about prayer and about being persistent in their prayers, those that knock, those that seek, those that ask. They continue to press in and press in and press in. And he says here in this verse that you fathers, if your child asked for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How much more Will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Is that there is so much more to be desired, to be sought after. And when you talk about a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, who is uh, the, the alpha and the omega, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is that you can't just allow yourself to camp out at a little stream, is that knowing that the further you press in, the more magnificent he becomes and the more powerful of an experience and an encounter with God you get to partake in. And so up to this point in my life though, prior to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, one of the things that struck me was that when I would come across Zechariah 4.6, which says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Is that prior to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the pre-Pentecost, Ryan, would look at that and feel like it was, I was living the exact opposite. Is that it actually was, I was living the life of faith by my might and by my willpower and not by very much of God's spirit. And so it was a flip and a change that happened after that point when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where it certainly did then. Now all of a sudden, Zechariah 4.6 made so much sense to me when it really truly felt like I was living in a way where it was no longer just living by my strength and living by my talents and living by my willpower, but I was actually experiencing the Spirit of God alive and active in my life, where things began to fall off, where for years I had struggled with sin or temptation or different things, and they had just fallen away, where I had been trying to uh, mitigate those or minimize those things by my strength and in my own power, all of a sudden it was by his spirit that they fell away. 
and where I had just been trying so hard to work up the courage to be able to step out and do anything engaging in faith conversations or divine appointments outside of a Sunday sermon or a Sunday service or a life group on a Wednesday night is that now all of a sudden post-Pentecost is that the encounter with God became daily. It became weekly and it also became outside of the four walls of the church. In it, and I began to see God move, not just in a Sunday service, not just in a life group, but I began to see him move all over the place. Whether it was Target or Chuck E. Cheese or Starbucks or McDonald's or Chick-fil-A or any of these places where I was just now open and eager to be able to encounter and to give God an opportunity with others. Because for the first time, it truly felt like I had tasted and seen and experienced a life-altering power of God that marked my life, that left me with a definitive memory of a God encounter and a God experience experience, which has become the anchor for my soul. That doesn't mean that I don't occasionally have doubts or I don't occasionally wimp out in stepping out uh, with, with people. But when those thoughts come from the enemy, trying to whisper lies into my head and whisper lies about my identity and who I am, is that I have an anchor for my soul, that I have particular vivid memory of this encounter with God that forever changed things. And then, so we, we look at this receiving of the Holy Spirit when we first believed, but now we look at this baptism in the Holy Spirit, this immersion in the Holy Spirit. And that's where in Matthew chapter three, verse 11, John the Baptist actually gives us a heads up to this experience. When he says, I baptize with water, those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even, even uh, worthy to be his slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then we see this kind of pick up in Acts chapter one, verses four through five, where Jesus fulfills this prophecy from John the Baptist. And in Acts chapter one, this is right before his ascension into heaven when Jesus is sitting there and talking with the disciples, giving his final instructions before he would ascend into uh, the throne of heaven. And he says, once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John the Baptist uh, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So keep in mind, what do we have here? Well, in, at the end of John, Jesus tells them that he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. But yet now Jesus in Acts chapter one is saying, don't leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So there was a receiving of the Holy Spirit, but there was also a baptism coming, a full encounter and immersion with the Holy Spirit that would mark a day in their history that would forever change their direction of being sent out. And this is where, with his baptism of the Holy Spirit, one thing that I want to stress the most is that to, to seek, to knock, to ask. But also in the, the New Living Translation of this, in Luke uh, chapter 11, five through 13 in those verses that Jesus says in this translation, it says, if you keep knocking long enough, and he's referring to going and asking a neighbor for bread for your visitor. He says, if you keep on asking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. But ultimately we lead that back down to where he says, those of you that ask, those, those fathers, you ask the father, how much more will he give you the Holy Spirit? He's saying, have shameless persistence in asking for more of the Holy Spirit. Have shameless persistence. And this is my testimony in this, is that I prayed on and off for this thing for three years before I experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't a one-time encounter where I, got to, where I heard about it in a church service or a sermon like this, and I came forward and I received the Holy Spirit and the baptism although that happens for some people, which is amazing. But for me, it was not that quick of an experience and a turnaround on those prayers. But it was three years of pressing in, praying, asking, and being open to the movement of God before it happened. But it certainly required a shameless persistence. 
And then in Acts chapter one, verse eight, Jesus says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, <clears throat> through Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So here in this ending portion of him setting them up and, and giving them this preview of what's to come with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he also gives them the direction of not just what's coming, but why it's coming. So what do we receive? We receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why do we receive it? So that we will receive power and that we will be his witnesses. It's not just a fun party trick, is that it's for heart transformation, to be his witness, to be empowered, to be emboldened, to be sent out. And in fact, uh, the great evangelist Reinhard Bonnke once said that when you receive this anointing is that it's for the sending. It's not so that you can just be an anointed couch potato. It is that it's for the get up and move. It's for the sending. It's for being in the activity of God. And so you see this with the, the post-Pentecost disciples this pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And as you continue to read through the book of Acts, you don't just see it in Acts chapter two, but you also see it in several other spots and chapters throughout the book of Acts, where the disciples are being sent out. People are hearing about the word of God. They're actually hearing not just from the, the, the apostles, but they're hearing from the others that are now being sent out, sharing the message of Christ, telling people about the kingdom of God, bringing people to repentance of sin, but also then the disciples and others arrive on the scene only to ask them, but have you yet received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Have you received the Holy Spirit? And several of these people who have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, who have repented and been water baptized, had not yet received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you even see this in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48, where it says, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. Here he is speaking to the Gentiles. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. Which is incredible to hit pause in this. That the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, wasn't just for the elect. It wasn't just for the apostles. It wasn't just for these elite Jewish uh, followers of, of Christ. Is that it was for the Gentiles and it was for all to come. Anyone who has a desire and a softened heart and a willingness to receive can experience this. And it goes on to say, for they heard, for they heard uh, them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter asked, can anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? So he's not just talking about it, he's, he's re referencing how just how we did. Go back eight chapters to Acts chapter two. Pentecost, the, the fire falling on them, the Holy Spirit consuming them, saying they have received it just as we did. So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then in Acts eleven fifteen 15 through 17, Jesus speaking of this moment continues to say, as I began to speak, he's giving a retelling of the encounter. As I began to speak, Peter continued, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he fell on us at the beginning. Then I thought of the Lord's word when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he has given us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? Is that this is their encounter. What he's saying is that this encounter with God and encounter with the Holy Spirit is for everyone, for all, for those that would come about. And, and I'll be honest, for so many years, I think my only knowledge of people with the baptism of the Holy Spirit or a crazy encounter with God, whatever you want to call it, somebody that had really been, been transformed in a, in a crazy encounter. Anytime you hear somebody say, oh man, you got to hear this guy's testimony. It, it's always somebody that has just made a wreck of their lives. That's become homeless because of drugs and abuse and all these other things and is living their life in this ditch and hitting rock bottom. And then they get radically transformed in an encounter with God that forever changes things. And then they become empowered and become become a bold witness for Jesus Christ. It's either that or it's these missionaries that have been through Bible college, 
when they were 18 and then sent out into the, the missionary field and experiencing all these great encounters of God, he said, that was my experience was that it was either these people that had a clear, distinct, early call in their life and went straight into ministry, straight into the miracles and encounters of God, or those that had gone off the total deep end. And so there was this kind of lie on my life, if I'm being honest, that I believed for quite some time that I wasn't good enough, but I also wasn't bad enough to experience a powerful encounter with God. Is it because of these two examples is that I felt like I wasn't good enough or I wasn't bad enough and I was in this weird liminal space in the middle where it, was, where it wasn't for me. I either needed to really go off the deep end or I needed to somehow become holier than thou and then I would finally receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it was in this reading and actually in that, that, on that, that Friday morning, September 22nd, 2017, that I was reading this book called The God I Never Knew by Robert Morris, which is about these bab- the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and I was excited because this was the, the, the book I had been waiting for, an actual clear explanation of what this thing was and what it was all about. And so I began reading the first few chapters and I got all excited and I actually skipped like six chapters looking for like a how-to chapter. I was like, there's gotta be a how-to somewhere in here. And so I jumped, I think it was chapter 12, read through this chapter of a clear explanation of it. And at the end of the chapter, it said, it's as simple as this, just putting down this book, asking and being open to God, uh, to receiving God's baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so I did just that. After three years of praying, seeking and pressing in with shameless persistence, I finally put this book down. I knelt down behind, uh, b- beside my coffee table in our kitchen And I prayed and probably for 20 minutes, just allowing the clutter to kind of clear out of my head and out of my mind. And then about 20 minutes in to just this peace with God, all of a sudden came this powerful, overwhelming experience from head to toe. And when I tell you it was that I marked this on my calendar as a day that would forever be changed. It's because the consuming, it wasn't just a good warm feeling that I might have or a little bit of an emotional experience that I might have in a, in a worship service, but it was a full blown immersion from head to toe, the power of God that was just coming on me so intensely that my hands became clenched and my muscles became tight. And I started to hunch over gasping for breath in this experience and in this encounter with God and began asking for more and more and more, but it became so intense and so overwhelming that eventually I actually had to stop and, 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 and ask for it to let up because I could, it was having trouble breathing, but it was this crazy encounter and, and experience with God. And the reason that was so incredible was because as as a person that's kind of more typically shy and introverted is that this was an experience that I'm not a hyper emotional person. It wasn't worked up in in a worship service where there's lights and fog machines and, and all these things going on. It was just me and God. And then the Holy Spirit came in this baptism, this immersion And then God spoke to me and shared several words for my life, for my wife's life, uh, for for some family members, and also even just received in continued prayer a word for the, the crossing guard at my son's school. And it was this moment where I eventually, I don't even know how much time had passed, but I come up out of this experience. And I knew I needed to write down everything that the Lord had spoken to me. And I wanted to jot this down so that I would never forget this encounter, this anchor for my soul, kind of a moment in my life that would forever transform me. And it was a day where an empowerment came into my heart, came into my life, where my desires changed, where the things that I longed for or I had interest in, certain interests and certain hobbies completely fell away. And it just become this overwhelming hunger and desire for the word of God, for sharing Christ with others, for discipling others in this experience and in the faith. It has been my sole focus from that moment on, from September 22nd, 2017, All the other interest in movies and TV shows and sports and other things that I had have completely fallen away. And I've become solely focused on the cause of Christ. 
And that was the result of this moment. And actually, one of the very first things I did was an act of obedience because he had given me this word for this crosswalk at uh, crossing guard at my son's school. That when I took him to school that morning <clears throat> and dropped him off, uh, I waited around with a moment to be able to share with her what God had put on my heart to share. And so uh, I went up to her and waited for a moment. She was talking with another lady. So eventually I kind of had just had to interrupt a little bit, but to say, hey, excuse me. Uh, but uh, this might sound kind of random, but I was praying this morning. I felt like God put you on my heart and, and put this on, on my heart to share with you. And I shared with her that God sees her and, and loves her and cherishes her and that he values so much the work that she does at that corner where there's hundreds of kids and parents coming into that school and across that street, that she is a light, that she is a beaming smile for all to see, and that he's so proud of the consistent work that she does and the presence that she brings to that corner of that street. And that the, the, the things of this world, the status of this world might diminish her role as a crossing guard, but God sees it, loves it, and cherishes the work that she does, and it has eternal implications, and how much God loves her, and just pouring out this message, and even the woman standing by her side even stopped and was like, that's the sweetest thing I've ever heard. And we all had this great moment and this great time because of God. And she said, hey, if God ever puts you <laughs> it puts me in your prayers again. Please, please let me know any time that he does. And that was the beginning of a series of divine appointments where there would be dozens and dozens ever since that point. And so one of the things that I want to share and wrap up with <clears throat> in this encounter with God is that one of the things that comes to mind is 1 Corinthians 4.20 that says that the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk, but it's living by God's power. That for the majority of my life, up to the age of 36, I felt like I was engaging in a lot of talk and very little power. And from that moment when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in my, in my kitchen dining room, it has changed where, yes, the talk is important, but the power is equally as important. It's this idea of even when Jesus sent out the disciples in Luke chapter 10, he says, go out and, and heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, and teach them about the kingdom of God. Give them an experience and an explanation that we have far too many Christians that are living merely off of explanations and not experiences with God. And I promise you, if you have shameless persistence to press in and to ask and ask and ask and ask, to knock and continue to seek that God will show up in your life in a powerful, powerful way. And I pray that it is a one-time ask and a receiving for you. Even though that wasn't the case for me, I pray that it is for you. And it could be for somebody here this morning. But even if it's not, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking because God will open that door and he will release an immersion, a baptism, a flooding of the Holy Spirit upon you that will mark your day and change you. And you will remember and think of yourself as the pre-Pentecost version of yourself and the post-Pentecost version of yourself. And you will be sent out to be his witness. And you will be able to share the testimony of Christ the way that you so desire in your heart. Because I know that there are Christians every Sunday coming to churches with a desire and a longing in their heart, but lacking the power and the empowerment and the boldness to do it. And where that empowerment and that boldness often comes from is from the baptism of the Holy Spirit that will give you that edge to step out and to be empowered to do so. So I just want to say, go after it. Never give up. Is that when we even hear the description of King David, it says that he was a man after God's own heart. That we would be that men and women going after God's own heart with shameless persistence. And that God will show up and show off in our lives. But we can go all in press in knowing that things will forever be changed. And so what I want to end with is this, that there's an opportunity for those of you that perhaps all this baptism, the Holy Spirit talk is, is amazing and everything, but you are yet to experience a true relationship with Jesus Christ. You are, are yet to believe in your heart and profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And perhaps there is something happening in your life, a stirring, a softening of your heart that I want to just ask you that if you haven't yet done that, to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. That whether you're watching the live stream or you're, you're, you're watching this in Glendora, that we don't need to, to, to lead you. I can lead you in a prayer to accept Jesus Christ as, as your savior. But you know what would be even more powerful is taking some time to get alone with God, 
to confess your sins. He already knows them. The confession isn't for him, it's for you. To just simply to be able to acknowledge all the ways that you've fallen short. Because what that does is it shows you how far God's going to take you in the present and in the future. And he's going to give you a marked day and a testimony. So get alone with God. Confess. Open your heart to the receiving of Jesus Christ. And then if you have already done that, but you haven't yet been water baptized, get water baptized. It is that this church is constantly having regular opportunities for water baptism. You ask and they will make it happen and they will get it done and they will create that space. And there's the leading of people to Jesus Christ that we can lead you in a prayer and and bring that to you in an instant. If you ask to be water baptized, we can fill the tank and we can do the water baptism. But there is a special moment, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, that it's not something that I can do. It's not something that Pastor Jim can do. It's only something that God can do. So go to God, ask him. If you need to come forward to the altar and pray to receive, then by all means, come do it and let this be your time. If you'd rather go home and get into a quiet space and into uh, a a state of just mindful meditation and, and focus on God, and ask him for this baptism in the Holy Spirit, then go home and do that. And if it requires you to go to that space, day after day, year after year, continue to do it because I'm here to tell you, it is so worth the shameless persistence because he will show up, he will deliver. And so that's what I'm gonna pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you have hungry, if not desperate people in this church that want an encounter for themselves with you, Lord. That your word says, ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door will be opened. Seek and you will be, and you will find. So Lord, you have people that are knocking, that are seeking, that are asking. May your Holy Spirit fall on them right now, Jesus. That your Holy Spirit would come upon them in a powerful, bold way that they would experience a peace that surpasses all understanding, that they would experience the presence, the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit in their heart and from the top of their head to the tip of their toes, that you would come upon them. Lord, give them more and more and more of your Holy Spirit. It's not just for a fun story. It's not just for a fun encounter. It's to be transformed from the inside out. It's to be emboldened, to be out, to sent out as a witness. For this world needs more bold witnesses for Jesus Christ to come in love and to deliver the truth and to deliver opportunities for others. That once we have our encounter with Jesus Christ, it's all about going out and giving others an opportunity to experience what we have, to give them an opportunity to taste and see that the Lord is good. So God, Bring it. Bring your Holy Spirit upon them. Well up in their heart. Take over and consume their life that they would be forever changed, forever marked, forever sealed. That they would be anointed in your Holy Spirit, empowered. And may that come with words of knowledge and prophecy and healing and casting out demons and doing the mighty work of the Lord here on earth. So Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we lift your name high. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Uh, Here at Real Life, we celebrate uh, communion together. Um, In so doing, we remember the meal that Jesus celebrated with his followers uh, right at the end. He gathered around this table on what was their Independence Day to say, I'm going to give you a new independence in me. The bread and the wine that he shared became symbols of his death for us on the cross. When we believe that he died for us on the cross, everything that would stand between us and the voice of God is taken away. All we have to do is believe. And so, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and giving thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. 
And so we eat this bread and drink this cup and remember Jesus' death for us on the cross until he comes again. This is the table of God for the people of God. Receive the elements when you're ready. If God and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today, um, whether you're listening to this online, on YouTube channel, or live with us, and you have more questions about what is prayer language? What does it look like to speak in tongues? What does baptism really mean? Where is it at in the Bible? How does that mean in my life, even though I was maybe baptized like me when I was a kid and got baptized again as an adult? Those questions aren't questions you have to do life alone with. There are people here that love you and are praying for you. So email us anytime, info at reallife.la and say, I have questions. I need to talk to someone and join us for our prayer, uh, our prayer class with Pastor Jim. Absolutely. And then we have worship night this next Friday, like we talked about. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is a really big, complicated idea that, again, we don't want you to unpack on your own. We want you to know that we're here for you. And we are also baptizing like in the water people in the next couple weeks. So if you feel like today's message really spoke to you or someone that you know needs to hear it, share this with them. Oh, yeah. Let us know how we can come alongside you. You're being prayed for and cheered for. Have a super extraordinary holiday Fourth of July. <laughs> yeah. Go crazy. Woo! Yeah. And we'll see you next time.